Hi. If we've not met before, I'm Steve. I'm uh, a member of Restore Community Church and I attend the congregation that meets in Woodford. And I'm really pleased that I've been asked today to speak to you about the peace or the promise. We're currently in a series looking at the story of Exodus. And today I'm going to talk about journeys, I'm going to talk about battles, and I'm going to talk about trust. But first, I'm going to start with a brief comment about learning. There are many ways to learn something, and no particular way of learning suits everyone. If it's something practical, then often the best way is to learn by doing. Some learn best by seeing, and sometimes the pressing nature of an issue can cause us to learn very quickly indeed. If being able to learn requires our full attention, then one of the best ways to get it is through a story. And if the story is someone else's personal experience, then we're right there with them. And this is one of the reasons that the Bible has endured. Even if you're not a person of faith, it's packed full of engaging stories and lots of wisdom. Some of the best stories involve a journey, a quest. Even though it's not the Bible, think Lord of the Rings. Here, in Exodus, we have the story of a journey. And as in any story, there are lessons to be learned from what happens and from the choices that the characters make. So, there are two texts... And the first one is from Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 and 18. When Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not let them take the road to the land of the Philistines, although that was the nearest way. God thought that the prospect of fighting would make the people lose heart and turn back to Egypt. Instead, God led the people by the roundabout way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. The sons of Israel went out from Egypt fully armed. And the second passage is from Exodus chapter 14, verses 21 and 22. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove back the sea with a strong easterly wind all night, and he made dry land of the sea. The waters parted, and the sons of Israel went on dry ground into the sea, walls of water to the right and to the left of them. So, journeys. The Israelites are on a journey. And if you're planning on setting out on a journey, you might Google, or you might Satnav, or if you're old school, you might dust off the road atlas. Whichever you choose to plan your route, the question you want to answer is, What's the best route to take? Well, what's the best route can depend on many different factors. If time's an issue, you want the quickest route. It may be that you want to avoid roadworks. It may be that you want a route that allows for sightseeing on the way. So why did God take the, choose to take the Israelites by way of the Red Sea? Not because it was the quickest route, there was a coastal trade route towards Gaza and an overland route towards Beersheba, which were both more direct. So why did God choose a different route? Well, the Israelites may have had some idea of what lay ahead, but God knew exactly what they would face. God also knew what the Israelites were like. All they knew was the life of a slave, and although they left Egypt fully armed, we're not talking about elite troops able to deal with even the toughest of conflict. God knew that there was a strong possibility that they would lose heart when they experienced opposition, bow out and go back to Egypt. God's just spent 10 chapters getting them out of Egypt. He doesn't want to give them a reason for going back. So that's why God didn't choose the quickest route. And God's assessment of the Israelites is borne out by Exodus chapter 16, verse 3, and chapter 17, verse 3, 
and Numbers chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. In each case, the Israelites have an issue, usually about food, and each time they contrast their lot with what they had in Egypt. Don't they remember that they were being given the impossible task of making bricks without straw, and that when their wives had male children, the male children were killed? Apparently not. They were too taken with the thought of meat, fish, cucumbers, melon, leeks and garlic. As Christians, and like the Israelites, we're committed to a journey with God. We have recognised our need of him and surrendered our lives, all that we are, to him. So what are the lessons for, from Exodus for us? Well, the first lesson is that God is committed to you. He knows you inside out. Read Psalm 139 if you're in any doubt. We might question the way that God is leading us. We might question the situations we face, especially if they're not turning out the way we've expected and prayed. We might, but then we come to the third thing. God is God and we are are not. He sees what's before us and is more than equal to dealing with any and every situation. So let's think about battles. The land that God was taking them to wasn't empty. There were already people who'd been living there a long time. How would they react to over 600,000 people and their flocks and herds coming to join them? Well, Humanity doesn't have a very good record of welcoming immigrants, whatever period of history you look at. It's a situation set up for conflict. The text says that because God knew his people so well, he knew that they weren't ready to fight. In fact, even the prospect of battle might make them draw back. They would fight the battles one day, the people who lived in Canaan weren't going away, But God had some work to do with the Israelites first. In fact, the rest of the Exodus story shows that God had to help them with the battle to be who God said they were, as well as the battle of trust. Now, similarly, as we journey through life with God, it may not always seem easy and often may not seem to be straightforward. This can be because, like the Israelites, We have patterns of thinking and ways of behaving that we need to work on with God. These can be seen as our battles. The encouragement here is that if we're journeying with God, we can know that we're more than equal to what we face. God knows us inside out, just as he knew the Israelites. Another principle here is that it's important to know which battles to fight. It's a marathon where pace is important and not a sprint. When confronted by lots of things on our journey, we should ask these questions. So where are we now? What's the situation that we're in and what is in front of us, an immediate that should have our focus? Don't get distracted by what's further ahead on our journey. There will be time to address it, but it's not today. Trust. Well, the second reading is part of the narrative telling of how the Israelites escaped safety from the pursuing Egyptians. And I always have in my mind a scene from an an old Hollywood film. Moses leading... The Israelites are eagerly gathered around him, faced with a large body of water in front, and the Egyptian chariots, which are the super weapon of the day, hot on their heels. Moses raises his staff and miraculously the water parts. The Israelites walk through, and when the chariots follow, they get stuck in the mud. The water comes crashing back, totally destroying the threat. There is a little Hollywood license here. Yes, the Israelites were stuck. The Red Sea meant that they couldn't go forward. Yes, 
the Egyptian chariots were in hot pursuit. Pharaoh had changed his mind yet again. Yes, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. No, the water didn't part. Well, not at first. They had to wait all night before there was a way through. Imagine how Moses must have felt. He did not what God told him to do, and it looked like nothing had happened. There was just a bit of wind blowing in. Now, with hindsight, we can say, but God had said it, and we know it will happen. Well, if you're Moses and the Israelites, you're not able to turn to the end of the book and read the happy ever after. So what do you do? What would Moses have to do? You have to trust in what you know of the character of the person who told you what to do. This is why testimony is so important. If it's happened before and God's come through, then the same can happen now for us. Moses had seen the burning bush. Moses had heard the audible voice of God speaking to him. And Moses had already seen how God could command the natural world. So Moses was already well placed to trust God on this one too. I find this encouraging, don't you? How many times have you prayed full of faith that God will answer and then nothing seems to happen? Nothing seems to change. Well, we're in good company. We're in exactly the same situation that Moses was. So what do we do? Well, number one, we don't give up. Number two, we trust in the character and nature of God. And number three, we continue to have faith that we will see him work. And when we see what God has done, what do we do? Well, what the Israelites did, the answers in chapter 15 of Exodus, we party, we sing, we dance, we praise God. So this week's theme is called the peace or the promise. Perhaps it ought to be called the comfort or the promise. In the midst of the flight from Egypt, the Israelites saw their past situation through rose-tinted spectacles. They wanted to trade a form of peace and comfort, the known, for the uncertainty and hardship of where they were. Yet the promise, as yet unfulfilled, was so much better in comparison. So what do we choose? Do we choose the peace or the comfort of the known, or the promise, the promise of God, that requires trust in the nature and ability to fulfill of the one who's giving the promise. What have we learned from this part of the Exodus story? Well, we've learned that God can be trusted to lead and make a way in any situation. Isn't this just for the people in the Bible? No, because as it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse eight, our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he's done it before, he's able to do it again. We're going to have a brief time of reflection. So get yourself comfortable. It might help to close your eyes. Think of something that's been on your heart and mind. It could be something you've been promised but haven't seen full fulfilled. It could be some situation that's very immediate at the moment. Now imagine that God is right next to you and you have his full attention. Now tell him, tell him about it. You don't have to use a lot of words. And now give whatever's in your heart and mind to God.
And this is the tricky part. Leave it with him. And now listen. Is God saying something to you? Amen. I'd encourage you to repeat this reflection regularly. In the days of sailing ships, you'd regularly need to check and correct your course. However carefully you'd done this one day, the wind and ocean currents could divert you off course so that you were going in totally the wrong direction the next. And similarly, we as humans are subject to all kinds of things that could cause us to get off course. This is why it's important to regularly reflect and realign with God. Thank you.